We're back for another session of our study of the epistles of Peter, and today we'll pick up with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. I'm going to move back about four verses, five verses uh, from where we ended uh, last time because I want to pick up on a thought that the Apostle Peter uh, was writing to these early Christians, these early Gentile Christians living in Asia Minor. And you'll remember that so many of these folks had come from other lands. They were brought there as exiles as part of the Roman conquest. Many had been slaves, sold at the Roman slave markets, and then brought to Asia Minor by their masters. And for the most part, these early Gentile Christians lived in the working class strata of society. These, I've compared them to the coal miners of West Virginia, and then of course if you're a slave, it was just a horrible existence. And so last time as we talked, um, Peter was trying to share with these folks, um, these new Christians, that how to live in a non-Christian world. Christians were still a new religion at that time, and as well, in that part of the world, they were the decided minority. Even the Jewish population was very small, and what was really unusual about this particular situation was the Christians and the Jews actually got along, which was very unusual uh, in first century, uh, in the first century world. But instead, these the persecution was coming from the pagan religions, largely because they saw Christianity as uh, a foreign religion in that no one had ever heard anything like what they were teaching. They were teaching one God, no tolerance for other gods. Uh, they were seen as, these Christians were seen as elitist, and there were a lot of rumors flying around, and so uh, typically that almost always leads to some sort of persecution. And so Peter wants to talk to um, these early Christians about maintaining the faith and living um, the Christian life as the people of God, but yet as well living as model citizens in um, their towns and villages of Asia Minor so that people have absolutely no reason to persecute them other than their own made-up prejudices. And of course, we see that a lot today as well. Maybe, you know, not so much for Christianity, of course, especially in the United States, but yet a lot of persecution comes because people just don't understand other people. And that was much of what was happening here. And we talked a little bit last time about how Peter was uh, invoking what was known as a household code uh, and then putting it in a Christian context. And that so many of these early Christians were told that you need to live, uh, you know, beyond reproach. That, um, and, and he outlines the household code and parallels it with the teaching of Jesus. So this time we're going to pick up, like I said, with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. We're going to go through the end of the fourth chapter. And if we were to give a name to this particular section of Scripture, it would have to be, Do Not Fear Suffering. Well, the, I'm the world's worst when it comes to suffering. Uh, Phyllis will tell you that uh, I am not a good patient. Uh, when I'm sick, it's the worst the world has ever seen for that particular cold or the flu or whatever. But yet the suffering that we're talking about here for these early Christians it, you know, was um, the persecution type of suffering and there were arrests regularly on trumped up charges and they were beaten. And of course those who were slaves oftentimes had to live um, with horrible masters. And again, I just don't see think that there is anything that we can compare um, this to. And so I think what we have to do is just imagine the worst. But yet... That's an important part of what Peter's going to say. And I want to talk a little bit more about that, but first I want to talk about how we typically respond to suffering, particularly within the Christian faith. Um, and much of the time, the response that I see um, leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, when I was in uh, seminary, uh, as I've mentioned before, I went to Lexington, Kentucky. I did clinical pastoral education there, working in a hospital. And then through the years, I've seen several responses to suffering that are, well, they're not exactly helpful or productive. One of those responses is what I'll call the avoidance suffering, uh, the avoidance um, approach to suffering. Basically, what it says is, is that we'll go, you'll see people go into hospital rooms or, um, you know, go into to comfort someone who is suffering and they say, try not to think about it. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in the hospital uh, several times for surgeries, and, well, you're in a hospital. You can't help but think about it. 
And so using that approach, I don't know that it's necessarily helpful. As well, there are those who will say to people who are suffering, well, it could be worse. But the problem is at that point in time, and particularly with these first century Christians, I don't know how we would even be able to imagine anything that would be worse. And that doesn't really help you. I mean, it's not like suffering comes in degrees. At the time that you're suffering, you know, that's what's foremost in your mind. Uh, another approach to suffering is sometimes referred, uh, referred to as the unsympathetic sympathy. And when I say unsympathetic sympathy, I'm talking about those folks who go in and say, I am so sorry that you're going through this, and they'll dump a lot of sympathy, but yet what most people who are suffering want is someone who will be there with them and who will listen to them and who will not try and make it somehow better using unfortunate words. Uh, there is the transfer approach. That's where someone tries to say, well, look, there's other people who've had it worse than you, or I know it's bad, and I remember the time when either I had this happen, and typically that doesn't help a whole lot, or they've heard of someone else who not only had the suffering this person's going through, but even more. And, and I just don't think that's a very productive approach either. There's the um, nauseatingly religious approach or the, unre the unreligious religious approach, I guess I, I could, would probably be better off saying. Um, those are the, that's sometimes the approach where someone decides God is testing your faith. There is nothing in Scripture that suggests that God causes suffering in order to see if we are faithful. Uh, it's usually the result of bad um, misinterpretation of Bible stories by teachers, well-meaning, yes, but bad interpretation, or by ministers who just didn't take the time to read their commentaries and to study what a particular scripture lesson is telling us for that particular time. Um, there's also the, uh, the approach of, well, uh, this is all part of God's will again. Nowhere in scripture do we read that God causes suffering for faithful people uh, as part of some divine plan or will. Instead, I do believe that uh, when we suffer, God sheds the first tear. And that's what leads us into the gospel approach, which is the one that, for, that Peter takes as he's trying to tell the folks, look, I know you're suffering. And he says, you're slaves. I mean, it's an awful life. You're living in the lowest strata of society. It's a, it's, it's a hard life that you live. All right, and I get that. But what I want you to remember is, is, is that you are loved by God and that our Savior Christ did suffer as well. He knows your suffering. He's experienced the worst suffering there was. I mean, let's face it. Can you think of anything worse than being crucified, nailed to a cross with these big, I mean, I, I, I always think in terms of railroad spikes, maybe they weren't that big, but still. Or, yeah, but these were large nails that were pounded into your hands and your feet. You were hung on a cross. Virtually every bone in your body would be broken. Um, ultimately, you would die a slow, painful, agonizing death of suffocation. And so, you know, all that to say is, look, Christ suffered. And if we believe that Jesus was fully divine and fully human at the same time, then when he hung on that cross, he suffered. And so Peter wants to say, look, it's, it's not that it's worse. It's not that, you know, others have suffered. It is the fact that Christ knows your suffering, all right? And that in the Christian life, as we have embraced God through faith, that God hears our prayers and hears our cries, and he knows that we're suffering. And so, therefore, you need to put your faith in God in the middle of your suffering, now, from there we pick up, that's sort of the background to, where, to this whole thing today. And we're going to pick, like I said, start with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And through the 16th verse, Peter's going to talk about this new way of life that he's been speaking about all the way through his epistle. Um, and, and, and kind of the theme that he's going to pick up in this section is one that my mother told me time and time again. Two wrongs don't make a right. If you're suffering because you, you, are, you have a, an awful master or you're poor and you're working hard but you're not, you, you know, whatever that you're living in poverty, your, your suffering all right, is real. And that's just where you are in life and things are probably not going to change. God does not swoop down like the song says and uh, buy us all Mercedes Benz. Instead, God is with us in our suffering. All right. 
And so in suffering, our response should always be a positive. If there's a negative, add a positive. If we are treated unfairly by someone, treat them fairly. And you remember all through the gospel messages was this story. If someone takes your, takes your, uh, your, your shirt, give them your coat as well. All right. If someone strikes you on one cheek, offer them the other. It is Christ's way of saying, let's respond in love. And Peter is picking up on that. And in the um, first section of this, he reminds them that they are now the people of God. And when you're the people of God, there's a way of living. I remember when I first came to Alabama, you know, and, um, and, and was introduced to uh, college football like I'd never seen. I mean, granted, I'd come from Memphis and the University of Tennessee, um, you know, but they were way over in Knoxville. But I get to Alabama, and I, I still maintain to this day, the first question I was asked was, Alabama or Auburn? Well, ultimately, when I married Phyllis, um, she told me I was an Alabama fan, although our son-in-law went to Auburn, so we can go War Eagle, too, right up to the Iron Bowl. Um, and to tell you the truth, it's just, you know, I love college football, uh, no matter who's playing. However, the thing is, is, is that what I learned was you had to have your colors and you had to have your shirts and all that. And so anyway, now that I'm, I'm an Alabama fan with, uh, with, with Auburn leanings at times, I have the right, uh, stuff that I need. And <clears throat> by the same token, uh, Peter wanted these folks to know that when you're a Christian, there's a way of living that is just suddenly takes over your whole life, even more than following your favorite college football team, be they Auburn or Alabama, all right? And that in this way of living, we don't do it alone. We're part of a community of faith, all right? And so, and, and what I really like was is that I've really grown to like the Revised English Bible. Um, and so I actually ordered a copy. You can get them on Amazon. I think it was about $36. This is a Hey, this is the soft cover edition. I'm going to have to give me a cover for it. But I really like in chapter 3, verse 8, how uh, this translation um, reads. And it says, Finally be united, all of you, in thought and feeling. Be full of brotherly affection, kindly and humble. Do not repay wrong with wrong or abuse with abuse. On the contrary, respond with blessing, for a blessing is what God intends you to receive. And then he goes on and he, he, he quotes uh, Psalm 34, um, which, you know, once again uh, stresses the idea that we're people of God and that God wants us to always respond in love um, rather than responding to violence back with violence again. You know, do good to those. I mean, let's face it, if they're going to do violence to you until they see that, you know, we've seen it a hundred times. Someone uh, attacks you, they're expecting to be attacked back. But what if you respond in love? All right. So that's what Peter is trying to tell. And that, he says, that is the way of the community of faith. And you're part of this people of God, and that's how you need to live. And it, it reemphasizes that whole um, passage, uh, or that whole thinking all throughout the Gospels um, that says, uh, we all, that good overcomes evil, love overcomes hate. Peace overcomes anger, and the light of Christ always overcomes the darkness in the world. And so, um, and, and he says, but, you know, even then, once people begin to see how you're living, and they begin to say, what has caused this change in life for you, then I think you also have to be able, and Peter says, you have to be ready to explain that to them. And in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 3, um, he writes to the folks, But hold Christ in your hearts in reverence as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense when someone challenges you to justify the hope which is in you. But do so with courtesy and respect. Now, you know, that is a, that, that's an idea that I think so many people, so many Christians in our world today need to remember. Because quite often in Christianity, it's like, this is the way that, that you're supposed to believe. And if you don't believe this way, well, then you're just wrong. No, maybe we've experienced God in a different way. I mean, so often what happens in these days is, again, bad preaching, bad teaching leads to ideas that are more in line with what a person thinks than rather with, a, with the gospel. And so as we begin to hear 
you know, what other people believe, what other um, branches of Christianity are teaching and all that, I encourage you to always think in terms of First Peter and that particular letter. Listen to what is being said to you. Respond not in defense, but respond in love. And listen, and we just might, we just might come to experience God in a different way. And believe me, Anglicanism uh, is so wide. Episcopal theology is so broad in terms of being able to accept other people's experiences of God. Believe me, God being infinite and almighty, there's plenty, of a, there's plenty more for all of us to understand. Um, next, Peter moves more into uh, the idea of, look, when you suffer, be sure you suffer for doing right. It goes back to Mother's uh, age-old teaching, two wrongs do not make a, my, a right. And so it's, and it's better, he says, and this is a really interesting kind of thought. I hadn't thought about this much until then. But he says, look, if you're going to suffer, which you are, it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing bad. Because if you're doing bad, it's sort of like, you know, if you always tell the truth, you never have to explain it. All right? But if you, if you don't tell the truth, you have to go back and remember the lie that you told and the justification you gave and then after a while well it just things keep piling on and Peter's reminding us that look if you respond with good then that's the light shining in the darkness okay and if you respond with good then after a while people begin to see that I mean people know what the right thing to do is even when they're doing the wrong thing they know what the right thing to do is and so if someone is persecuting you, someone is attacking you, someone is treating you unfairly, then I think, you know, what Peter is saying here is, is look, let's go ahead and remember that, you know, if you, if you live the good life, if you respond in love, if you respond to evil with goodness, eternal life is always the end and God always wins. Now, Next, he introduces in verses 19, 20, and 21 four new ideas that, well, we could spend an entire session just on these four ideas. So when you get to verses 19, 20, and 21, and he starts talking about making a proclamation to spirits in, in prison, that actually comes from the book of 1 Enoch, which would be a, a, a scriptural, it's, it's not part of the Bible, it's extra biblical, we'll call it, all right? But people would have been familiar with the story. And so um, that, again, it would take way too long to try and explain that whole story, but just know it would be a, it was something when he says proclamation of spirits in prison, everybody would understand what that meant. And then he talks about, um, as well, knowing the ark, and he points to how that is, uh, you know, uh, that we have a new way of looking at baptism, knowing the ark with the water, destroying the world, and there was, but there was new creation you know, when the dove brought back the olive branch, that was the symbol of new creation. Well, just as that has happened, in baptism, you have become a new creation. And so he wants to remind them of that, and that, that in verse 21, baptism is less about washing clean and more about appeal to God for a good conscience. In other words, is, is that it's saying it's not so, it's, you know, John came with a baptism of repentance, but yet... Uh, Jesus came with a baptism into new life. And so not only um, is it washing away the old, but it's giving us a new way to live. Then we move into um, chapter 4 and what we'll call transformed living. And again, it picks up on this whole idea from Peter is, is that in our baptism, we've been given a new way of living. Now he wants to talk a little bit more about it. And I guess probably what I had to say is, is that, look, the, I've had soldier, shoulder surgery twice, all right? Um, this shoulder right here. The first time it happened, it was awful. All right, the recovery was terrible. I didn't think I'd ever experienced anything like that. And of course, remember, I suffer worse than everybody else does. But the second time I had it, it wasn't near as bad. And the reason was because I knew what to expect. And Peter takes this kind of example and he says, look, you know you're going to face persecution. You know you're going to suffer. But you know where the victory is, and that's in your faith. And so you know what's going to happen each time, so just get ready for it. When people mistreat you, when people abuse you, when your masters beat you, you know what's going to happen. First of all, don't give me a reason to do that. And then second of all, when it does happen, then look toward the love of God and find the peace that passes all understanding. All right, and so he also tells them, look, cease from sinning. 
All right, it doesn't get you anything anywhere. Now, I do think what we have to remember here is, is, is that there's a difference between sin and sins. And so when Peter talks about living the life of sin versus, you know, the new life that you're giving, the life of sin is focused all on me. Okay, it's all about me and everything I do. And, and so there's nothing to sep. well, actually, there's everything to sep separate me from God because I'm the one separating me from God. That's the life of sin that he's talking about, the life where God and Jesus don't make a bit of difference. But when we follow Christ, all right, there is no expectation that we're going to be sinless. There's no expectation that we're not going to occasionally separate ourselves from life. Martin Luther once said, you know, throughout the day I am saved again and again and again. And I understand that because throughout the days I continually experience the love of God. And I, maybe when I experience it the most strongly is when I've turned away from God for a while and thought only about myself. And then suddenly I am reminded that really what my call as the Christian is, is to think of others and to love God. And so rather what Peter says is to remember that love conquers all, that the hope of the Christian message is, is that God always wins, and that what we need to do is to ask ourselves continually, what would God have me to do? That would be much better, you know, on a bracelet or something than WWJD would be instead WGWWYTD. What would God want me to do? So, uh, he, and, and he reminds the people that, look, yes, God understands your suffering again, and when you suffer, though, rejoice. I mean, you think about it, is, is that when you're persecuted, if you rejoice, then that counters the negative with the positive. And, um, you know, I always say one of the best ways to rejoice is do a gratitude list. Take a piece of paper, put a line down the middle of it on the left-hand side, put down all the things that you have that's causing suffering in your life, all right? You know, whatever they are. Then on the right-hand side, put down all the blessings that you have. Now, every time I do that, the suffering list keeps getting shorter and shorter eventually. And if I'm honest, the blessing list just keeps getting longer and longer. So the next time that, you're, um, that you need something to rejoice about, go do a gratitude list. And that he does say that, look, we don't let suffering be the focus of your life. Don't all, we've all met people who are like a one focus in their life and everything is interpreted because of that. Instead, what you want to do is, is let Christ be the center of your life. And yes, you're going to suffer, but don't suffer just for the sake of suffering. Rejoice in your suffering that you've got the hope of Christ. That's what he means whenever he talks about rejoicing in your suffering in chapter 4. He says, look, it just means you're not suffering alone. God is with you. You're not suffering without this new way of living. You're not suffering just for the sake of suffering, and that's all you have. Instead, you have the new life in Christ. All right, well, that brings us to a close. Next week, we'll talk our next session. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Chapter 5 and bring First Peter to a close.